Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, one local college could be closing its doors for good. You got all these people that are suffering that had nothing to do with it. All they wanted was a quality college education. What went wrong with the Art Institute of California, San Diego? Plus, a new wildlife center opens in San Diego, how thousands of animals will benefit. And a new opera is debuting in San Diego, but the location will be different, where San Diego Opera is staging the experience. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening, it's Friday, March 8th. Thanks for joining us, I'm Ebony Monet. The Art Institute of California, San Diego may be closing its doors. If the college isn't purchased today, it will cease operations. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman spoke with students and teachers. Students entered school here hopeful for a better education. Now, many of them are exiting, wondering what they're gonna do next. That's pretty frustrating, it's like nobody really has an answer but they expect you to have an answer. Many students said the same thing. News about the looming closure suddenly came this week. Honestly, I heard about this two days ago. Really? Yeah, it was it was a big hit for everyone. No one, no one knew it was coming. Culinary arts student Angela Armstrong was in her final quarter of school here. I was a pending graduate, so after this quarter, pretty much I would be done with school. Um, but unfortunately, due to funds and such, um, the bankruptcy, uh, the school is shutting down before then. But luckily, since I am a pending graduate, I get to still receive my degree. Others aren't so lucky. I was a student here. I had 173 credits, and I needed 180 to graduate. Ben Orloff Falk says he recently transferred from an art institute in Colorado and was told he would be able to finish his degree. I'm more pissed off that the people lied to me blatantly to get me to come here to the school because mm -hmm. I know for a fact that I called the administration here and while well, I was trying to figure out my next steps in Colorado and they guaranteed me that they would be open and they have not even a quarter and a half, two quarters, and they are shut down. It's ridiculous. Both students and staff are affected by the closure. This is a great facility, a great building, and I just, you know, don't, I, I'm, now I'm getting emotional. Chef instructor Kenneth Hargrave says he's been at the Art Institute for 10 years and will miss one thing. The students, as an educator, it's definitely not about the money, okay? News of the closure hit him hard. How do I feel about the whole closure? You might not like what I'm going to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it, uh, you, know, you know, professional. It sucks. I don't think that's too bad of a word, but it sucks. I, I you know, it's, 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 it's not right. It is what it is. Am I going to be sad? I'll be really sad when they start taking the sign down, you know, because a lot of memories, and I have a lot of memories. He says students will suffer the most from this. You got all these people that are suffering that had nothing to do with it. All they wanted was a quality college education. Hargraves had one message for students. Culinary students and AI students, if you're watching this, just just move forward. Understand that it, it's, it's bad, it's what's happened, but know that a lot of your instructors out here really genuinely do care about your education, generally do care about what you're going to do in the future, okay? As I've been saying the whole time we've been talking in this interview, turn a negative into a positive, okay? It, you're, you, you, you're responsible for what you're going to do in the future. Um, don't let this stop you from what you want to do. If you got a goal that you want to do, keep, keep moving forward. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. KPBS has reached out multiple times to see if the school has a buyer, but no word yet. A new wildlife care center is opening in San Diego. The San Diego Humane Society held a ribbon cutting today to celebrate the new facility. San Diego sees thousands of injured and abandoned animals each year. The center will help save those animals through its Project Wildlife program. The Humane Society president and CEO spoke about the benefits. When you go inside, you're going to see uh, state-of-the-art surgery, uh, medical treatment center, 
uh, habitats that actually specialize in decreasing the stress of the animals that are within them. That's the biggest issue that we deal with, stress animals uh, from the wild. We can lose them quickly if that happens, so we are grateful to have a facility where we can actually keep prey and predators apart and make sure those animals have as little stress as possible. At least 200 wildlife animals will be moved into the facility in the next two weeks. California's fur industry could fall out of fashion if a new law is passed. Animal welfare advocates were in Sacramento this week to support a potential ban on sales and manufacturing. Advocates claim inhumane practices continue to be commonplace in this industry. The ban would only apply to new products with exceptions for items used for religious purposes and to continue to participate in the fur trade in the state of California. The argument that it provides employment and economic contribution as a business, and therefore it should be defended, does not hold up in this day and age. The ban will head for a vote in the Assembly Wildlife Committee next week. San Diego saw some sprinkles throughout the morning, but for the rest of the day, the county was relatively dry. That's changing. Meteorologist Dazia Swad has our weekend forecast. As we continue through tonight, still going to be some locations here across San Diego, San Diego County dealing with some windy conditions as well as winter weather, and that's going to be in the higher ground. So into the mountains, we are under a wind advisory until 8 p.m. tonight. We'll also be looking at another weather alert until 10 p.m. tonight, and that's our winter weather advisory in this lighter shade of blue. We're going to be talking about snow. And that's because we have chilly air in place as we have a trough over us and we'll continue to see colder conditions with some of our next systems that's going to allow for those snow levels to get quite low. So if you're around 4000 feet in your elevation, you're looking up to an inch of snow. Anything higher than that as you head to 5000 to 6000 feet, two to four inches of snow possible, 6000 to 7000 feet four to six inches possible and it gets even higher uh, with that snowfall as well as that elevation. So if you had above 7,000 feet, eight inches of snow or greater potentially coming your way. We'll continue once again into tonight to be mainly clear as you head into the coast with a low 52 and we'll watch this moisture fade out into the mountains as well. Drier conditions persist into tomorrow. Looking at low 45 in Borrego Springs, Mount Laguna a low 30 and as that winter uh, weather advisory expires, the precipitation will also be limited. 46 in Oceanside for tonight. We move into your Saturday. Still pretty cool for March here across Southern California, as well as in Nevada and Arizona. Rain really going to be out towards our north, so we shouldn't see too much in the way of wet weather as we continue into your Saturday. However, clouds still going to be very present here in Oceanside and San Diego with a high of 61. Top it off at 67 in Borrego Springs and 42 in Mount Laguna. As we head into the early week, another trough begins to dig into the southwest. That is going to bring in some more rain into San Diego. The bulk of the moisture should stay to our south in a, uh, into Mexico and that uh, is going to be our best bet at this point in time, but we're definitely keeping an eye on that system. So for the next coming uh, several days here, you're looking at passing showers Sunday and a shower into Monday, partial sunshine Tuesday with some windy weather returning. We'll also see the same pattern inland with highs in the 50s for Sunday and Monday with wet weather, uh, mostly cloudy in the desert Sunday, passing shower Monday and into the mountains. We'll be feeling that cold air for the end of the weekend. Reporting for KPBS News, I'm your meteorologist, Dodge. Swad, back to you. The Joffrey Ballet is one of America's most prestigious dance companies. It's making a rare stop in San Diego tonight. KPBS arts editor Nina Guerin spent the morning with the company. She tells us more about what to expect from the performance. My name is Ashley Wheater. I'm the artistic director of the Joffrey Ballet. The Joffrey is probably one of America's great dance companies. We embrace the entire um, spectrum of dance. 
So we are not in the, in the model of George Balanchine, we are not in the model of 19th century ballet, but I think that Robert Joffrey believed that dance was such a broad subject and that we're a very eclectic company that has always been willing to push the boundaries of dance and to show audiences like where dance is going. The one thing about saying the word ballet is that for a lot of people it conjures up, you know, tutus, very pretty. The reality is that we have moved forward and I think that uh, in the program tonight you're not going to see a tutu but I think you're going to see work that is really engaging. Whether you've never been to the ballet before, I think that the whole program is about that relationship between the audience and the, and the dancers, and I think the dancers respond to an audience. I think the Joffreys always have that ability to connect. My name is Dylan Gutierrez, and I'm a lead dancer here for the Joffrey Ballet. There's a lot special about the Joffrey Ballet. My, my favorite thing is how versatile we are. We're kind of like a shape-shifting company. You can come and see us do one thing, and then you can come and see us in another program, and you might not even recognize the people you're seeing, and it's the same people you're seeing, you know? Um, we switch from classical to contemporary to kind of performance art um, very easily, and I think the company takes a lot of pride in that. Uh, it's not just kind of like something we do and are told to do, it's something that we like to accomplish. When you're with a large group of people and you have the same goal, it's, that's like an exciting feeling because there's no one lagging behind or pulling people back. It's kind of all towards the same thing. The root of our foundation is classical ballet. It's our language. But you will see in the program that that language can be really broad. And the program is really broad and it's a very eclectic program. And I think that for audiences, they're gonna see some really beautiful, beautiful dancing. The Joffrey Ballet isn't the only performance to look forward to. San Diego Opera will be staging its detour series, Chamber Opera, three Decembers at Patrick Henry's new auditorium. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando has this preview. What do you say when a professional opera company wants to stage a production at your high school? Oh, amazing. <laughs> Matthew Kalal is still reeling from the fact that San Diego Opera chose Patrick Henry's new theater for its three December's chamber opera. That's because the school facility has come a long way. So what we have before was uh, basically elementary school style uh, cafetorium with folding chairs. And that's what it had since the school opened in 1968. But a journey to a state-of-the-art facility began almost a decade ago, and the result is the Patrick Henry High Arts, Media, and Entertainment Performing Arts Center, also known by its acronym, FAME. One of the things we, we keep talking about, like in career tech ed and other things, was internships, so students going out to places and getting some experiences, and we're thinking, well, if we build the right kind of place, there will be groups that will be interested in coming here. It proved to be exactly the right place for San Diego Opera's Detour series. The Detour series looks to anything that goes beyond what we think of as traditional opera. The series reflects the opera's eagerness to take a path that's other than ordinary, both in terms of the works chosen and the venues used. And this particular choice of venues pleases singer Kristen Clayton. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm just so impressed that San Diego has um, had a theater like this built into a high school. Mezzo-soprano Frederica Von Stata agrees. This hall here is a dream. It is a dream. It is exactly the right size. The acoustics are terrific. It is such fun being part of a, a high school. I applaud all the energies and the efforts to get this done. And I love the fact that San Diego Opera has this affiliation, because there, there are many pieces that just shouldn't be in a great big hall. Pieces like Three Decembers, which is a modern chamber opera. A chamber opera just means there are many fewer instruments. In, in this case, the clarinet, oboe, cello, 
violins and pianos. So the pianos, the two, there are two pianos, and they're very prominent. Which is why the 500-seat Patrick Henry Theatre is perfect. So when I think of chamber opera, I think of an opera that you can come to that will hopefully be in a smaller size house and that you'll be able to really connect with and relate to, possibly even like going to see a play. Three Decembers was based on a Terence McNally play, and it's very accessible with its contemporary storyline involving a self-centered actress played by Von Stada. but she is holding a very big secret about the kid's father. Clayton plays her daughter, Beatrice. The past was a little bit cloudy about what happened to our dad, and so my brother Charlie and I communicate every Christmas through these Christmas letters that she sends us. And this year that we're in, in the beginning, kind of sparks some information about them that we didn't know, so we kind of go on this little trek wanting to figure out more. Both Clayton and Von Stada created their roles with composer Jake Hege. Being able to have him call me and say, I gotta play something for you, How, what do you think? And be connected to the very beginnings of an opera is, I mean, there's just nothing like it. And there's nothing like bringing a professional production such as Three Decembers into a high school to inspire a new generation of opera lovers. It's the kind of thing that gets students excited about it and it's just, it's a, instead of just seeing it, it's really getting more involved with it. So it's, it's really super exciting for them to be here. <laughs> and exciting to see where San Diego Opera's latest detour has taken them. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. San Diego Opera's Three Decembers only runs tonight through Sunday at Patrick Henry's Fame Theater. There's a push to get more women into construction. As Joseph Frederick from the Associated Press reports, it's forming a diverse workforce. You see that, that, that pin on the bottom? bottom. Mm -hmm. You're going to line it up with the hole right underneath. Third-year plumbing apprentice Jana Rojas left a job in social work in search of better pay and career advancement. Rojas is joining a growing number of women in the construction trades, bolstering the ranks traditionally held by men. I was looking for some kind of security, also a skill that I can take anywhere, and that's very useful, very important, and um, just in life. According to the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics, women hold 3.4 percent of all construction jobs. That's roughly 285,000 women out of 8.3 million construction workers nationwide. The total number of women in construction rose about 31 percent over the past 10 years. We've had a real shift in terms of really working with our, the unions as partners in our work because they recognize that the need for a diverse workforce, a workforce that represents the population of New York City and beyond. The Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York is working with the nonprofit group Non-Traditional Employment for Women to recruit women for apprenticeship programs. The women that I have here, no, they work. They'll do anything I can do. They'll probably pick up the pipe and run with me or whatever, chop a hole, core drill, do whatever has to be done. They'll get it done. Rojas went through news program. She's now learning on the job alongside her male counterparts. This was something that I, that is spelt out for you on how you advance in the, in the first couple of years and you know and then once you once you complete the program you're the exact same pay as a 10-year veteran. Perhaps when they are themselves skilled plumbers. In Chicago a group of women recently graduated from a similar pre-apprenticeship program through an organization called Chicago Women in Trades. The nonprofit offers graduates access to mentoring and tutoring from seasoned tradeswomen. People might say that it's a man's job because it's dominated by men, because women has been frozen out of this industry for so long. And now that the opportunities are presenting themselves, then it's time for us as women to seize this opportunity. The tradeswomen say the male-only culture on job sites, often laced with sexual innuendo, is changing. Any comments that might have affected me before doesn't now, you know, you grow a thick skin. So, yeah, it's not a problem at all. Another change, job sites have started accommodating the needs of tradeswomen. 
Do they have access to uh, restrooms? Do they have safety gear and clothing that fits them? And we've seen real progress in those areas and real work in our partnership with the apprenticeship programs and the unionized construction programs to ensure safety, security, and opportunity and real advancement for women in the trades. The construction industry is predicting a 12% growth in jobs over the next six years. And women plan to be part of that growth, equipped with the right tools as it happens. Joseph Frederick, Associated Press, New York. Over the last decade, the total number of women in the construction industry has gone up by about 31%. I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the News Hour with Paul Manafort's 47 month sentence, a look at disparities in the lengths of prison terms. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. It's time now for our Friday business report with Miro Kopik from SDSU and Bottom Line Marketing. So, Miro, welcome. Thanks, Ebony. So this week, <laughs> Apple sweetened the deal. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner and Apple representatives announced that they'll actually be bringing, the company will be bringing 1,200 jobs to its new campus, location TBA. This is up from 1,000 when it was first announced in December. So Miro, what do we know about the jobs that will be brought and what could a larger Apple presence mean for the region? Well, as, as the mayor said, a larger Apple presence is great for San Diego. Um, the types of jobs are going to be engineering and software jobs. Apple is really looking at bringing their modem business in-house. They used to use Qualcomm chips for their phones. Um, when there was this kind of you know, lawsuit between the two companies that uh, Apple contends that Qualcomm charged them uh, ro the incorrect royalty fees, Qualcomm contends that they violated the patents. This resulted in $2 billion of lost revenues for Qualcomm. During this time, Apple's been working with Intel. In the new 5G world that we talked about last week, Qualcomm is way ahead of everybody, including Intel. So Apple's saying, we need to bring this stuff in-house so we can manage our own future. Because right now, over half of Apple's revenues are from cell phones. So Apple is no longer a computer company, it's a cell phone company. And so these jobs are really important because the modem kind of drives the, the, the cell phone device. And so this is really important for Apple, and I would suspect that 1,200 is not going to be the number. Over time, it's going to be much greater. And what they found is that since Qualcomm over the last year has laid off well over 1,500 employees, many of whom would fit these specs for uh, Apple, they are, um, they've got the pick of the litter right now. So staying here in San Diego, um, there's some, some good news for, for renters. Um, based upon a San Diego Union Tribune report, rent prices shouldn't go up significantly this year, and that's based on a, a new study and some expert analysis. Um, can you talk about what's causing the slowdown? Well, you know, San Diego is still the ninth most expensive market in the country for rent. Um, we've had double-digit rent increases since the recession, and as recently as 2015, almost 8% increases. So for this year, they're expecting a 1% to 2.5% rent increase, which is, is great from a um, um, capping the price on rentals, but we it's very expensive to, buy, to rent. So an average one-bedroom apartment is $1,500. An average two-bedroom apartment is $2,000. It's comparable to L.A., Sacramento, and San Francisco. What's driving this is there's been a lot of multifamily housing being constructed, not just in San Diego, but all over the country. So rents all over the country are only growing at just under 1%. So that really helps um, maintain the level of rent. There's more housing that's available. And at the same time, our single family housing market, sales have declined because the pricing has gotten to the point where people can't afford those homes. And so renting is still a better option for many people who would like to stay in San Diego. So moving on, um, currently Charlotte Roos is having a, a liquidation sale. So I should be going there soon. But um, bad news for the company because it is announced that after filing for bankruptcy, it's actually going to be sh shutting its locations here in San Diego and across the nation. And it's, it's far from alone. This week, Victoria's Secret, Gap, JCPenney, and Tesla all announced store closures. And we've spoken about this before. You've said that traditional retail stores are not going away. 
But what could this mean for, for malls? Because many of these stores have prominent positions in malls across America. A lot of times malls are really reimagining the mall to create a better experience for consumers with a lot of different things, including restaurants, theaters, and other, other things. So it gives the mall operator the opportunity to kind of uh, clean out space, restructure the space for new and better tenants. Um, a lot of the other stores are just restructuring. So the Gap or Victoria's Secret, they're just closing some stores of the thousands of stores that they have just so they can be more profitable and be in better locations for them. Even, as you mentioned, Tesla, they're a little bit of an oddball. They're closing all their stores because they are only gonna sell online and they're trying to get, and one of the reasons is they need to get the price of their Model 3 down to 35,000, which is the promised price, in advance of every other auto manufacturer making their cars electric or hybrid within the next five years. So they want that market share lead and that's why they're closing their stores. Very interesting. Thank you so much for making sense of it all. Thanks, Nero Kopik, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Tracking journalists and others at the southern border reports that government is keeping tabs. The lengthy court process of handling house squatters and more school layoffs are announced. What's behind the pink slips? Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. We want to leave you tonight with an update on the Art Institute of California, San Diego. Just moments ago, the college officially announced it is shutting down. A school spokesperson says it will continue to try to help students transition into other colleges. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.